This is CBC Winnipeg News. Good evening. Thank you for joining us. I'm Riley Lechuk. Janet is off tonight. We begin with a CBC team investigation which found nearly a quarter of all Winnipeg nursing home residents are being given antipsychotic drugs at an increasing rate. They're being used without a diagnosis to treat dementia and control behavior rather than their intended use to manage symptoms of schizophrenia or bipolar disorder. The I-Team's Kristen Annabel brings us the story. Trish Rossthorn knows firsthand what happens when someone is put on an antipsychotic after her sister Linda was put on Respiridone nearly a decade ago. The drug is meant to treat mental health conditions like schizophrenia or bipolar disorder, but Linda's doctors use it to treat the symptoms of her dementia. So when she was on medication, she was very frightened. Um, she didn't really know what was going on. She lost the ability to speak. <laughs> she was walking 12 hours a day. Um, she couldn't eat properly. For years, these drugs have been used in nursing homes to treat residents, even if they don't have a diagnosis of psychosis. And that number is growing. In 2015, 22% of residents in Winnipeg care homes were on these drugs without a diagnosis. And as officials try to address that, the numbers decreased to 18% in 2018. But with the pandemic and staffing issues at nursing homes, that number has climbed each year, and now 23% of residents are on the drugs without a diagnosis. Trish's sister was put in Mr. Cordia Place in 2013, and immediately, Trish made it her goal to get her sister off the drug. And I said, this is absolutely ridiculous. So when I took videos of the mouth problems, her walking, uh, and all the other issues that she had, the physician there at Mr. Cordia Place agreed that we could try her off of it, and she never went back on them. And her sister came back to her old self. She had times when she knew who I was, who, who the family were, and she could have moments of enjoyment. Studies have shown that when senior patients are treated with antipsychotics, they can experience cardiovascular issues, infections, greater risk of falling, fractures, strokes, and even death. Experts say these risks need to be taken into consideration when prescribing the drugs to treat dementia or control behavior. If there isn't a clear reason for the person to be on it, then why are they on it? And what are the alternatives, especially when being on an antipsychotic medication you know, has additional risks like the increased risk of dying? The Winnipeg Regional Health Authority admits there is a problem when they see these numbers increasing. They say they review personal care home residents' medical charts every three months. And this summer, part of that review has been focused on reducing doses and deprescribing residents off of antipsychotics. Kristen Annable, CBC News, Winnipeg. If you have a tip for our CBC I team, you can email them at iteam at cbc.ca or call the confidential tip line at 204 788 3744. Families of seniors at Oakview Place Personal Care Home are grappling with news that their loved ones were hurt by people in charge of their care. This after two health care aides face assault charges in connection with the abuse of five residents. CBC's Aaron Broman talked to one family about the impact of the charges. It becomes reality that this happened to her and you didn't have control or be able to protect her. Gail Johnson got the news from a police detective Tuesday night. Her 91-year-old mother is one of the five care home residents at the centre of the police investigation. It's been emotional for sure. Um, I think what's probably impacted me the most in the last 24 hours is um, to see some of my family and how that's impacted them. Um, you know, my brother is, is quite upset. A 49-year-old and a 36-year-old woman are facing charges. Johnson doesn't want to go into detail, but says she was told the aides allegedly used force to get her mom to cooperate. I don't know how someone could be put in, in that role and feel that it was okay to do that to your loved one or to your elder or to somebody who co cognitively can understand or doesn't quite get what you're asking. The allegations of abuse first came to light in June. A staff member reported it to the Winnipeg Regional Health Authority. Someone else reported the alleged abuse to the home in February, 
but Extendicare, which owns Oakview Place, did nothing. They've since apologized, and now the province will launch its own investigation. There should have never been four months gone by without families knowing or the police being contacted. The allegations involve 15 residents. Charges were laid in connection with only five. A lot of these residents have passed away. How do those families get justice if their family members were victimized? Th that's certainly heartbreaking. Johnson says her mother still has moments where she doesn't want to be touched and believes what she went through has taken a toll. She's grateful for the staff members who had the courage to report. We're really thankful from the bottom of our hearts, our families, the other families who have been affected, because we may never have known. Johnson says she'll closely be watching what happens in court and hopes her mom lives to see justice. Aaron Broman, CBC News, Winnipeg. Well, we're less than six weeks away from Civic Election Day, and the long simmering feud between Winnipeg firefighters and paramedics has now bubbled up into the mayoral race. Winnipeg mayoral candidate Kevin Klein is accusing rival Glenn Murray of bowing to firefighter demands in exchange for an endorsement. Bartley Kivas reports. At his campaign HQ this morning, mayoral candidate Kevin Klein promised more community paramedics, the ones who treat people with less serious health issues. The idea is to lower the burden on emergency wards. We need to address the issues that we're having and not use the paramedic service and firefighters as a politician's agenda. That was a shot at rival candidate Glenn Murray, who promised in July to build separate stations for firefighters and paramedics. Klein said this will cost millions and millions of dollars. If you're going to immediately take ambulances out of our fire stations, that's not the solution. That's pandering to politics. Klein said Murray made that promise to gain the endorsement of the United Firefighters of Winnipeg. Klein said he learned that when he met with the union. But the union has a different memory of that meeting. In my recollection, that Councillor Klein was all too willing to separate firefighters and paramedics. Glenn Murray was Winnipeg mayor when the city amalgamated firefighters and paramedics. He now says that idea came from Susan Thompson, his predecessor. There was a, a wisdom at the time that this made sense, and, there was a, and it was attempted. I came in in the middle of that. In fact, Murray had been mayor for two years when the fire paramedic service was created. Regardless, he's not the only candidate who wants to split it up. On Tuesday, Robert falcon said he too wants to explore the idea. We've attempted to do this for a number of years, bringing two very different cultures together, and it hasn't quite worked. Mayoral candidate Scott Gillingham says he wouldn't split the fire paramedic service apart. We have to build all new uh, ambulance stations, and I'm, that, that would be an, an exorbitant cost, and I'm not committed to that. Gillingham, meanwhile, has mused about getting paramedics out of the city budget altogether, noting that health care is a provincial responsibility. Bart Lakivas, CBC News, Winnipeg. A physician is demanding action after Manitoba's largest ER ran out of room on the weekend. He says there are things that could be done immediately to help ease pressure on hospitals and staff. CBC's Ian Frey's reports. One doctor says we must ease the burden on emergency departments. It comes from Dr. Merrill Pauls after his ER at Health Sciences Center ran out of beds. There's things we could do tomorrow that would make life better for my patients and the nurses that I work with. Paul says some ER patients don't need to be there. They could be moved to medicine wards instead. He says ambulances shouldn't offload all their patients to emergency, and ER shouldn't be the place where patients wait to see a specialist. So this isn't an unprecedented wave of sick patients. This is a result of a whole series of choices that we've made, but it's also choices that we're making on an ongoing basis. So the system has decided that they want most of the risk to settle in the emergency department rather than other places around or outside of the emergency department. He'd like hospitals to pull more of their resources into ERs like it did for intensive care units early in the pandemic. But HSC's chief operating officer says that's not possible. That ability is now gone. There is no, um, there's no pool of staff we can draw from to be able to support the needs in the ED and the emergency departments right now. He says HSC is already spreading patients outside of ERs. He blames this again on staffing. Yes, ideally from an emergency perspective, you want to be able to move them through your department, but where are you going to move them to? The head of a national emergency physicians group agrees ERs deal with too much. It's a complex problem, uh, but it comes down to uh, human resources. 
do we have the people in the system to support the level of healthcare that people want or need? Uh, and it's a it's a it's a public equity question. Uh, what is it that our society wants for its level of care? And what are they willing to invest in? Today, the health minister spoke about the busy weekend at HSC and says this is the season for it. We tend to see over our weekends and our long weekends, particularly in the summer, fluctuations and um, increases in, in the level of acuity of care. Dr. Howlett says governments and health care officials cannot blame this issue on busy weekends, though the health minister says she wasn't attempting to minimize what those patients experienced. Ian Fraze, CBC News, Winnipeg. The federal government has declared next Monday as a holiday for the Queen's funeral, but there are many workers who won't be getting the day off. Even though they are federally regulated, Canadian banks will remain open. In a statement, the Canadian Bankers Association says banks will observe a moment of silence to honour the Queen. The provincial governments of Quebec, Ontario and Saskatchewan have also declared to not declare Monday a holiday. In Manitoba, all non-essential government services and offices will be closed, but K-12 schools will remain open. Many post-secondary institutions across the province are cancelling classes on Monday for the Queen's funeral, though. The University of Manitoba was one of the first to announce it would have a day off. The U of M Students' Union wouldn't take a position on whether it's in favour of cancelling classes, but it's prepared to support students who may be struggling with the decision. Here's what some U of M students we spoke to had to say. I was excited because I don't have to go to school Monday, but a little bit, it's like I was supposed to have a test Monday, so it's like, well, when's the test going to be? But other than that, it's like, I don't know, I'm happy to have the day off. She colonized us. Uh, I am from Bangladesh, so we were under her rule. Things happen, we all know, and I don't specifically like the royal family, so I don't really care. Even if you're not a part of it, I'd say it's still important, even if it's someone else's uh, part of their history. Along with the U of M, Red River College, Brandon University, the University of St. Boniface and the University of Winnipeg are also cancelling classes on Monday. Well, a woman who may have been Manitoba's oldest resident has died. Jemima Westcott, who went by Mime, passed away in Brandon last month at the age of 111. She is one of few Canadian super centenarians, having not only lived past her 100th birthday, but past her 110th. CBC's Holly Carrick has more on her life and legacy. Never change, be yourself, don't worry, and everything will work out. Those are the words Ron Westcott remembers his mother saying through the years at special family gatherings. It's hard to believe she's gone. Like, it just seems like she has always been there. Jemima Westcott, known simply as Mime, is one of few Canadian super centenarians. She died August 24th at the Dinsdale Personal Care Home in Brandon. She was 111. It was amazing when we think she lived through the Spanish flu. She lived through the two world wars. Ron and his brother remember their mother as an active woman. Even at 111, she said she felt like she was 60. You know, she never ever dyed her hair. Up till just a few days before her death, she was, um, you know, she was mentally intact. And she functioned independently in her own condo until she was 106. The Westcotts believe their matriarch may have been the oldest living Manitoban at the time of her death. She was among the oldest living Canadians, with just a handful of people her senior. She had that youth look to her. One of 11 siblings, Mime grew up on a farm in Lauder, Manitoba. Her sons often asked her what the biggest invention of her lifetime was. For Mime... It was the radio. So the neighbors would put the radio up to the phone and they, the kids would take turns listening on the phone to a hockey game. A prairie girl her whole life, Mime finished her high school years in Surris and later moved to Douglas where she worked as a teacher. There she met her husband Reg and had five children. Mime retired at 65 and then spent a year traveling Australia. And she traveled with a granddaughter and her some of her friends doing the hostel route and backpacking. She also traveled the world following her passion, curling. She was part of what they called the pond hoppers and they actually had a curling event during the worlds just for the, uh, the fans that traveled. Being 111, Mime was often asked what the secret to a long life is. One of her uh, common replies to that was, well, I don't worry too much 
and I'm nice to people. And that kind of sums up who she was. Mime's husband died in 1965, and she never remarried. She became involved in a longevity study through the Boston Medical Center, along with two of her siblings, who were also centenarians. One of the things that the scientists say is that mom and others like her have won the gene lottery. Genes that could be in the people she leaves behind. 15 grandchildren and 28 great-grandchildren. Her first great-great-grandchild is due later this year. Holly Carrick, CBC News, Winnipeg. And you say you interviewed her. Yeah, I, uh, we spoke to her uh, a couple years ago now uh, for, for a story. So wow. what what an amazing story that was. Yeah, amazing um, Cloudy and a bit cooler today outside. Yeah. And, and, and you are warning me that there's probably some rain on the way. Yeah, <laughs> rain on the way now. And a lot of people I'm talking to, whether it's social media or just through email, are saying, you know, the garden's getting a little dry. Yeah. And uh, maybe thinking of bringing out the sprinkler. Don't bother. Some rain on the way for tonight. We're going to show you radar and, uh, and all that stuff. Right now, the current conditions, though, we did get to 18 today. That was my forecast high. We're slipping a little, 17, as you would expect. East winds earlier today gusting to about 40, also as expected. But uh, here's a look at satellite and radar. And the rain is in western Manitoba and southeastern Saskatchewan as we speak. And you can see it, it does move quite a bit farther to the north. But we just simply don't have radar coverage right there where you see those those little curved lines there, that's the extent of the radar coverage. It is still raining out of the cloud you see in the satellite image up to the north. So some of that moving across northern Manitoba as well. Now Winnipeg at the moment, kind of in the clear, kind of just cloudy, but to the north of us and, and back to the northwest, areas like Dauphin, Alonza, Ericsdale, all in the rain at the moment. Uh, Brandon, Verdon just seeing a few raindrops in the area. But there's plenty of this to come. The center of the low is actually in Montana, North Dakota. It's north of the low that's spreading all of the rain into our area. Southeastern Manitoba and northwestern Man uh, Ontario is where we're going to see the brunt of this rain tonight into tomorrow. And there's a rainfall warning in this, this blue shaded area here. Now, Kenora, for example, 15 to 25 millimeters tonight. Another 15 to 25 tomorrow morning and then some showers in the afternoon. So up to 50 millimeters by midday on Thursday. No warning in southeastern Manitoba, but that's where the highest amounts will be, I do think, as we head into tomorrow morning. Uh, this is just after midnight tonight. Some of this could be storm activity. I don't think severe as far as large hail and heavy winds, that sort of thing, but I think we could see some very heavy downpours in some of these areas where you see the yellow and orange and red. Now, this is 8 in the morning. The rest of the day is just cloudy, but the rest of the day to the north is all sunny, and we're looking at temps close to 20 in Thompson and Flin Flon and the Paw. Friday morning, it's just unsettled. Lots of cloud. The odd shower here and there, not a deluge. Same with Saturday. We're looking at a cloudy day with some showers in the area. All right, rainfall predictions over the next 24 hours, about 7 in Winnipeg. And you can see as we go farther to the southeast and out to the east, the amounts are going to be much, much higher. Staying mild tonight, down to 11 only. East winds around 20 to 30, 25 to 30 in the morning, and a few leftover showers, and then just cloud in the afternoon and 17. Kind of what you see out your window right now, although the winds will be a little bit stronger tomorrow, once again, northeast 25 to 30. And then seasonal or slightly below for the couple of days after that, Friday, Saturday, 16 and 18, a chance of a morning shower on Sunday, and then maybe some sunshine in the afternoon and a high of 21 on Sunday. The weather update is brought to you by Home Equip, your trusted local source for Pride Mobility scooters. From sales to rental and repair, our team is here to serve you. A new outdoor pop-up park is now open in Brandon to give the city's more vulnerable population a place to rest and reprieve. It's a pilot project by the city of Brandon to help address the concerns of people congregating downtown. For more, we've reached Sa Shannon Saltarelli, the city of Brandon's community housing and wellness coordinator. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me here. So first, give me a sense of what this space is and what it looks like. 
So the space is a pilot, uh, which means it is uh, really in its infant stages of development. It's something we were able to kind of piece together uh, quickly in um, the response to the need initially for having additional washrooms available downtown. Uh, we do have one public park downtown that does have public access washrooms. They are not open 24 hours a day. And so, you know, one of the needs out of our community has been to have access to additional washrooms. So um, a great way to pilot that is just to um, insert some portable washrooms temporarily, see how it's received. And then in addition to having the portable washrooms there, um, we added in some picnic tables as, as a place for people to be able to congregate and, and visit uh, in the downtown area. What drove the need for this space? So again, the issue with um, having access to washrooms was one of the key elements. Um, also in our downtown area, we don't have a lot of places for people to sit uh, congregate, um, visit during the day. And it's not just our, our population that's experiencing homelessness that does, you know, require a place to sit and visit. Um, so, you know, people were spending time on steps of businesses or, you know, sitting in parking lots or sitting in back lanes and in a, in a really undignified, uh, uncomfortable way. So, you know, we wanted to create a space for them to be able to, you know, get off the ground and, and have a couple tables they can sit at and, and visit. Why was the location for this pop-up park important, uh, particularly where it is, I guess, in the downtown? Well, there's a couple factors. Um, I do, you know, believe in meeting people where they're at. Uh, the location is a, an area of downtown that is often frequented by the vulnerable population. So it's an area that is already being utilized. Um, to be completely transparent, the city of Brandon doesn't own a lot of property downtown. And so that location happens to be a small section of land that the city owns that's sandwiched in between properties that are privately owned. And so we did have access to that small piece of property where we had the ability to, to utilize it in, in a different way than it was being utilized, which was uh, not at all, <laughs> to be honest. So we were able to try and uh, put something more meaningful in a, in a space that wasn't currently being used. I mean, we're early days here. The, the park just sort of opened up here. But what has the reception been like so far from people who are congregating downtown? Mm -hmm. Well, it's it it is new and it has been had some mixed reviews and you know we we are still trying to fill in some of the gaps with you know getting the garbage bin in place um, and and it, just addressing a few other things and there is a, a long term vision that we definitely want to see but you know to answer your question a um, bit of a mixed review with concerns around safety uh, misuse mm. of the space these are risks that we were aware of. Um, and uh, on the flip side, there's been some positive response from both the vulnerable population. Um, we are thankful to have another space to be um, and have access to the washrooms. Um, some of the business community has been um, also positive um, around creating another space. Again, with only having one, you know, decent sized public park in the downtown area, you know, there is a need to create more space for people to be. Well, I certainly hope that this uh, idea takes off and, and we see this sort of expanding in the future. Uh, Shannon, thank you for uh, joining me tonight. Thank you again. Well, don't forget to subscribe to our CBC Manitoba YouTube page. You can find the latest headlines there. We're also posting our full newscast there as well. You can catch up and stay connected anytime. We'll have much more news coming up after the break. You're watching CBC Winnipeg News. I want to bring you some developing news now. A spokesperson for Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky says his car was involved in a traffic accident in Kyiv not long ago. The president was not seriously hurt. That is according to a statement from his spokesperson in the last hour. Earlier today, Zelensky paid a surprise visit to a newly recaptured town in the northeastern part of the country. It is seen as a significant defeat for Moscow, and Zelensky pledged to take back all of Russian-held territory. So we'll come because, because it's our land and it's our people. That's why we'll come. 
There was a flag raising and the president praised the troops who retook the town. It sits on an important highway in the region near Kharkiv and was a major transportation hub for Russian forces. Zelensky says Ukrainian forces have now liberated 8,000 square kilometers of the country. University and college students are among those who have made the return to in-person learning. And in addition to concerns about COVID-19, another contagious virus, monkeypox, has been spreading around the world, including here in Canada in recent months. CBC's Lauren Pelly takes a closer look at the situation on campus. Canadian campuses are bustling again after more than two years of COVID-19 disruptions. And this fall, schools are watching out for another pathogen too. Perhaps students will be asking more questions about monkeypox as it is a new communicable disease. Do you guys have a the concern comes after cases of monkeypox began spreading globally through sexual networks, largely impacting men who have sex with men. On university campuses across the world, that's a setting where, where sexual activity can, can commonly happen. This Toronto physician who has treated some of the city's monkeypox patients says schools need to educate students doing so in a way that's not stigmatizing and uh, avoids any sense of shame associated with sexual activity, I think is really, really paramount. CBC News asked more than a dozen Canadian schools about their plans to keep students safe if cases do pop up on campuses. Many told us they have educational resources available, while others are offering monkeypox vaccines. At least one university also has isolation rooms available for students who catch any contagious disease. And then we also provide them with um, uh, all the necessities that they may need, food, bedding, uh, all those other things that uh, they might need in that isolation period. Campus precautions are being put in place as the overall number of monkeypox cases in Canada is trending down from a summer peak. Still, health officials are urging caution. A downward trend can be the most dangerous time if it opens the door to complacency. We're continuing with... But this advocate uh, says students shouldn't panic plans. either. And I think it'll be important for universities to strike a balance, ensuring that the right information is reaching uh, the folks who need to hear it and not, you know, sparking unfounded um, concerns or anxieties um, among the broader uh, student population. A population that seems ready to have a more normal school year. Lauren Pelly, CBC News, Toronto. The car business in North America is in the throes of a major shift. The move to electrification is charging ahead and the use of gasoline and diesel is going to fade significantly. And this year, the North American International Auto Show in Detroit, in Detroit demonstrates the industry is changing gears. CBC's Nisha Patel is there. President Joe Biden toured the Detroit Auto Show promoting his administration's investments in EVs and a $900 million plan to build public charging stations across the U.S. I'm pleased to announce we're approving funding for the first 35 states, including Michigan, to build their own electric charging infrastructure throughout their state. Meanwhile, U.S. automakers here are also putting their EV plans into drive. This is the 2023 Chrysler 300C. Already one of the first big reveals, Chrysler brand CEO Chris Fillel says the company will roll out a limited edition of its Canadian-built 300 sedan before ending production next year. Chrysler is going 100% battery electric by 2029. It's a way to bid farewell to an iconic gas-powered car as more automakers move quickly to meet the era of electric vehicles. They say it's what consumers are looking for. Electrification is certainly top of mind. People are concerned about fuel economy and fuel prices. Many traditional automakers have scaled back their presence at the show, while some startups give a glimpse of the future. New players like Plug Zen, which supplies charging infrastructure, and Harbinger Motors, which wants to electrify trucks like delivery vans. Over the last year or so, the, the, the amount of my mail that is from people who think an EV could be relevant to them has changed so dramatically. Canada set a goal for all new vehicles sold to be zero emission by 2035. Consumers will get to test out at least some of them here at the Auto Show. Nisha Patel, CBC News, Detroit. Well, a Canadian startup is thinking small but has big plans. Upcycle Green Technology takes gas-powered compact cars 
and converts them into electric pickup trucks. It's targeting the fleet market right now and already has some orders it hopes to fill next year. CBC's Nancy Russell has the story. This is one of two prototypes of the new electric pickup truck. It started as an older model Toyota Corolla. The passenger seats replaced with a truck bed. The engine removed, replaced by electric batteries. These prototypes have been two years in the making. Progress slowed by the pandemic and challenges in sourcing key supplies, such as these electric batteries. It's amazing because this phase is so important for our business and now we are ready for the next step. They are still tweaking the design. The vehicles will sell for $35,000 with a range of 150 kilometers. And there will also be a more expensive version that can travel farther. Upcycle is targeting companies with fleets of vehicles who can use a smaller pickup for short trips as an alternative to larger pickup trucks. We have a lot of these small pickup trucks in Brazil. It's very common for us. But here in Canada, in North America, in general, it's hard to find one. So we think there is a good niche of market for this kind of vehicle. The company has received support from the federal and provincial governments and from UPEI's School of Sustainable Design Engineering. Students help with research on the vehicles and two recent graduates now work here. This means a lot to me because, you know, we're taking cars that otherwise may go to a scrapyard and giving them brand new life. You know, we're thinking it's gonna almost double the lifespan of these cars. The company says it hopes to create 12 jobs when the assembly line is up and running next year and have already sold more than 20 electric vehicles of the 100 they will produce in 2023. We have a small island and a small car company, so I think it's pretty, pretty nice. If all goes well, Antonini says they hope to ramp up annual production from 100 to 200 vehicles in the next couple of years. Nancy Russell, CBC News, Stratford. New fruit orchards and gardens in parts of Saskatchewan are stirring up excitement. They're bearing fruit and vegetables that aren't normally associated with the prairies. And as Ethan Williams explains, that could be thanks to climate change. I have a veggie garden with the fruit pretty much in the middle of it. Elaine McKegg's garden near Hudson Bay is ready for harvest, but it's not just tomatoes and carrots growing here. There are strawberries, plums, and even cantaloupe, 12 of them to be exact. We have an oak tree in our front yard. I figured if an oak tree will grow here, what else can? And why not push the limits? Dean Kreitzer has been growing fruit on a larger scale for 23 years. He owns over-the-hill orchards and winery, and his crop includes everything from wine grapes to apples to figs. I look at this as a laboratory, and in a laboratory you test things and you fail and you succeed. So that's kind of how I get through all the failures, and it's just learning how certain plants react to the Saskatchewan climate. The industry has grown quickly with just eight hectares of commercial fruit development in 1980 to 900 hectares and 250 growers today. Bob Boers studies fruit at the University of Saskatchewan. He says while warmer weather could bring more diverse crops and a longer growing season, it's hard on plants that are built to withstand the cold. The other issue is whether we get new diseases and pests Right, because our, our winters kill a lot of the insects that want to live here and or get them off to a slow start. As the planet has warmed over the years, plant hardiness zones have shifted. The higher the zone number, the warmer the temperatures are. And the biggest changes have been in western Canada. Next we have our row rhubarb. Elaine McKegg plans to keep pushing the botany boundaries in her garden. She's going to try to grow honeydew next year. Ethan Williams, CBC News, Regina. Still ahead, John Sauter is back in with his look at the Manitoba forecast. You're watching CBC Winnipeg News.
the Queen is now lying in state at Westminster Hall in London. Mourners will be able to view her coffin and pay respects until her state funeral on Monday. CBC's Margaret Evans has more on today's ceremonies from London. The great bones of Buckingham Palace framed the procession, carrying Queen Elizabeth from her London home for the last time. Her coffin borne by horse-drawn gun carriage, followed by her children and grandchildren. The march of history down the Mall, slow but relentless. The drumbeat of the funeral march keeping time as guns sounded and bells tolled. Many of those watching say they weren't prepared for the emotions that came with it. I'm a bit choked up. I can't really speak at the minute. I'm so sorry. Yeah, I didn't think it really hit me until I saw her crown yeah. on top of the coffin. Yeah. I was a bit like, whoa, yeah, that's that thing incredible. Yeah, such a tiny yeah. coffin and then seeing that it's, crown. Yeah. These women all met for the first time this morning. In the hours waiting for the procession to begin, friendships were formed. People have been waiting here for hours and hours. In recent days, we've witnessed incredible scenes in Scotland as people there bid a fond and dignified farewell to the Queen. Now it repeats here. There was gentle applause as the gun carriage passed along the route towards Westminster for the Queen, but for the family following too. William and Harry, who walked behind their mother, Princess Diana's coffin, 25 years ago, and their father, Charles, now bearing the sometimes lonely mantle of monarch. I'm glad that they got that little opportunity yesterday, that window of being alone at Buckingham Palace. But yeah, they have to, it's a very public event, isn't it? And I feel as though Prince Charles still hasn't been able to give, hasn't been given the opportunity to mourn yet. This phase of official mourning marks the start of the public's chance here in London to pay their respects to the Queen in person. The procession making its way to the Palace of Westminster, where she will lie in state for four days. Long lines began forming well before the procession left Buckingham Palace in the afternoon. The doors to Westminster Hall will remain open 24 hours a day. Margaret Evans, CBC News, London. Meteorologist John Sauter is back with us now, and you were talking rain in northwest Ontario earlier in the program, and a lot of rain. Yeah, a lot of rain. Uh, you know, it's looking like 30 millimeters plus, maybe wow. up, upwards of 50 by about this time tomorrow. I want to show you again the, uh, the rainfall warning that is in effect from Environment Canada, and it starts at the Ontario border. However, in southeastern Manitoba, areas like Sprague and Piney and perhaps Falcon Lake and areas around the, the White Shell could see some pretty significant significant amounts of rain tonight and early tomorrow before this system kind of moves its way off to the east. But yes, up to 50 millimeters by midday Thursday. A lot of that's going to land tonight. Uh, not as much in the Red River Valley. I'm going to start here with uh, the current numbers or 17 over at the airport, also at the Forks. Still 19 in Morris. It did reach 18 today in the Winnipeg area. And we still have a 20 on the map in Melita. Uh, back to the east, 15 in Kenora. Also in Barron's River, Gimli at 16 at the moment. Up into the north where tomorrow is going to be a beautiful day. Wait till you see tomorrow's forecast. But uh, temperatures are right around seasonal, maybe even a little above in some cases, like Gillam, Island Lake, and Churchill. Eastern sections of the province a little warmer than the west for a change. Lots of cloud, a few showers on the way into the north tonight. But these are the amounts that we're seeing tonight on uh, on through uh, into northwestern Ontario. Now, just 10 in Fort Francis, but you're just going to get another 20 to 30 or maybe even more tomorrow morning. So uh, where this lands and when will be a little different in various locations, but it'll total that 30 to 50 millimeters by tomorrow. And just rain overnight here. I've got about 7 to 10 millimeters for Winnipeg, slightly higher amounts out to the east and out farther east toward the Ontario border. It'll be much, much higher. Uh, tonight, uh, we have rain overnight in the west as well, and some of this is already happening. Dauphin, Swan River, Brandon has some rainy clouds in the area at least, and much of this is up through the interlake already tonight. And then the north, yes, at least a chance of showers, in some cases clearing skies, and in some other cases like Gillum, 
increasing cloud overnight, but clearing in Island Lake and a few showers around Norway House. Now, look at the forecast for the north. If you like sunshine, well, get in the car, hop in an airplane, and head to northern Manitoba. Check out Thompson, sunny, 20, mainly sunny, 16 in Churchill, 21s in the west, 19 through Norway House, even a sunny 20 in Lynn Lake for tomorrow. Here in the south, it won't be as warm because we're going to have a lot more cloud cover, some morning rain or morning showers followed by cloudy skies in the afternoon and we're going to see highs of just 17 in Winnipeg, 16 in Steinbach and Emerson and similar numbers out to the east. And then as we look at uh, the rain in the morning for northwestern Ontario, could be quite a bit of it for Fort Francis. Afternoon temperatures will be held back as a result. Thanks John. My pleasure. Still ahead, Winnipeg is becoming a lot more colorful with the month-long wall-to-wall mural and cultural festival. We'll hear from its organizers coming up next. Well, Winnipeg has been looking a lot more colorful these days, and I'm not just talking about the leaves changing color. The month-long wall-to-wall mural and cultural festival is well underway, and mural artists have been hard at work leaving their mark on our city's walls. For more, we've reached Chloe Chafe and Andrew Eastman, the festival's co-directors. Thank you for making time for us today. Hi there, thanks for having us. So first of all, maybe just tell me what the wall-to-wall -wall festival looks like this year so far. Absolutely. So uh, we are running all September, so we're well underway. Uh, we just finished a few events like our drag brunch at the Tallest Poppy, um, and our mentorship is really underway at Studio 393. Uh, and now we are painting murals, and we have three more huge events on the way. So, Andrew, what is happening uh, this week for the festival? So we have a couple murals underway. Um, we're really excited to be back painting some pretty big, exciting murals across Winnipeg. Um, we're painting one currently at the back of 474 Main Street, right in the heart of the exchange. Um, it's a pretty iconic wall. It has the old ghost sign of Burt Saddlery mural, uh, Burt Saddlery Co. on it. And we are preserving that sign and then accentuating it on the top and bottom with sort of study of that sign itself. Uh, the artist is Joseph Pilipil of the Traveling Sign Painters. Uh, so that's going to be a really nice pop of color right in the exchange there. Um, and we just wrapped up some uh, a piece over in West Broadway as well at Chips Vintage by Hannah Reimer uh, just this last weekend. And we're just gearing up after this rain clears out, hopefully to get a few more started uh, next week. We're looking at some of the images of the one at Chips Vintage right now. How much work goes into putting something like this together? Yeah, so as far as murals go, uh, it's a pretty lengthy process. Uh, it's lots of consultation with the building owner, with the community, finding funding, um, and then pairing a contemporary artist with this building. Uh, once that starts, it's a lot of prepping the wall, um, doing video projections, and then uh, painting, painting, painting. <laughs> <laughs> How do you scout where these murals are going to be put up? Yeah, we work closely um, with a lot of the biz organizations across Winnipeg, um, as well as lots of uh, community organizations. Um, and we partner with them to disperse their funds amongst their different uh, biz members or partners. Um, so we want to often work with the businesses themselves to find uh, mural artists that will work to celebrate what they're doing their best with their business. Um, so it's a lot of that and then a lot of also working with community organizations. Um, graffiti Art Programming is one of our main collaborators on the festival. We also work with organizations like Urban Shaman Gallery and Mama Way and End Homelessness. And they often have projects in mind that they want to execute and we are able to uh, facilitate those for them and integrate them into the festival. How would you like to see this festival grow in the coming years? It's a tough question, but I think we really want to continue um, really leaving a legacy of uh, skill skill sharing between artists so that there's lots of new emerging artists that are able to have the skills to create murals and events. Um, so we're really, really um, proud that the fact that we've been able to offer workshops and mentorships um, in the nine years that we've been doing this. So I think it's really that it's giving artists and the community the capacity to be able to produce public art um, for years to come. One last question for you guys. Uh, if people want to find some more information on this, where can they go? 
Yeah, you can visit our website, uh, walltowallwpg.com. Um, there's a list of all the artists, all the curators, all the partners, as well as a really cool interactive mural map there that shows the murals that we've created over the last nine years of our festival. Uh, so lots of information there. And you can follow us at uh, on Instagram and social media at walltowallwpg. Anywhere else? That's it. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Chloe Chafe, Andrew Eastman, co-directors of the Wall to Wall Mural and Cultural Festival. Thank you for sharing some information with us tonight. Thank you Thank so much. You. Another reminder for you to subscribe to our CBC Manitoba YouTube page. That's uh, where you'll find the latest headlines. Interviews like that will be posted there as well alongside our newscast. Catch up and stay connected uh, anytime. John has his seven-day forecast next. Well, there certainly will be lots of cloud around the next few days, and it looks like showers over the next few days. But the brunt of the rain falls tonight and tomorrow morning, and then just generally unsettled conditions as we head toward the weekend. Sunday afternoon may see a glimpse of sunshine. The warm day of the bunch is Monday at 23, and then we are still at 20 on Tuesday, but more showers are moving our way. When Jason Malinsky and his grandsons launched a pint-sized canoe in the Red River in May 2021, they were hoping to track its journey all the way to Lake Winnipeg. But instead, their little wooden vessel got a little lost. That is, until this past weekend, after nearly 16 months, a muddied and gnawed river gypsy was found embedded in the riverbank just south of St. Jean-Baptiste. The little canoe that could is our daily lift. So Malinsky and his grandsons dropped this little wooden boat into the Red River at Emerson over a year ago now. He had put his contact information into a little secure compartment in it. He got a call last weekend by a farmer who found it wedged in the riverbank. Malinsky rushed from Winnipeg to retrieve that hand-carved canoe. He thinks it likely got wedged in with some branches and survived not only the winter, but also the spring flooding we saw, or maybe, you know, a beaver got a hold of it or something like that. I, I'm not sure, but... It survived. Wow. <laughs> and there it is again. It must be a very well built canoe to survive. It really all looks like it, a really well built thing. <laughs> Thank you for being with us tonight. We will see you tonight at 11 for late night. Have a great evening. See you later.